Hello everyone! In all my travels through ancient sites in Egypt, I have always been fascinated with these megalithic, mysterious, perfectly crafted and massive granite blocks and sculptures. What tools did they use and how did they transport them? This subject raises a lot of controversy, but everyone agrees on one thing. The majority of granite comes from Aswan. But from where exactly? Today I'm going to take you on a journey through the ancient quarries in Aswan. Let's see the famous unfinished obelisk, as well as a unique and mysterious site, Sahel Island. Let's find out more about their history on site. In antiquity, almost the entire east bank of Aswan, along with a few islands on the Nile, were quarrying spots. Granite from Aswan, especially red or pink, was just right after sandstone and limestone, the most essential stone in ancient Egypt used from the beginnings of the Pharaonic period, 32nd century BCE. Hundreds of years of work with granite, the development of its processing techniques led to the era of obelisks in the New Kingdom, when the scale of its extraction exceeded the one from the times of the Great Pyramids, thousand years earlier, and at the same time significantly far exceeded the size of the Old Kingdom granite monoliths. The unfinished obelisk. If finished, it would have measured 41.75 meters and weigh almost 1200 tons. In terms of weight, it can easily be compared with the gigantic limestone monoliths from Baalbek. Though this piece of granite is also known as the obelisk of Hatshepsut, according to some scholars who claim to have found cartouches at the site, it might have been commissioned by Hatshepsut's successor, Thutmose III. Nevertheless, the obelisk has never been finished, as during the works this enormous piece of granite cracked in several places at its base and at the top. If finished, it would have been the largest, almost one-third longer than any ancient obelisk ever erected. Scholars believe that ancient Egyptians, in order to cut out and initially shape desired form, were pounding into boulders with hammers made of dolerite extremely hard and tough rock, as well as at some point of extraction they must have employed heat. They also might have used soaked wooden wedges, which expand and so crack the rock. These theories result from the discoveries of a large number of hammers, charcoal, ash and burnt mud brick in ancient quarries. But I think we're still missing something. Most likely obelisks were transported during the annual flood of the Nile, always downstream. Thanks to depictions discovered, we know that two giant obelisks of Hatshepsut were transported by 27 boats for the obelisks with three pilot boats. Though many archaeologists, engineers and architects carried out countless trials, there's still no consensus about the way in which the obelisks were erected. The unfinished obelisk shows the attempts to reuse this damaged block. During different periods it was tried to obtain a smaller obelisk, but with no effect. The latest cuts date back to the Roman period.
obelisks were to resemble the sun's rays shining down and were most visible signs of the pharaonic power. They are surmounted by pyramid-shaped like peaks that refer to the Benben stone, a representation of the primordial mount place of all creation. The word obelisk derives from Greek obelos, created by Herodotus, which means nail or pointed pillar. Ancient Egyptians called them tekhenu, which means two piers. We've just seen the most famous quarry in Egypt. Now I'm going to take you to a unique, special site, rarely visited by tourists and almost never filmed. So stay with me! We're heading to one of the largest islands on the Nile, located upstream from the first cataract, where Egyptians quarried granite and mined gold. It was a popular stopover for traveling merchants and the pharaoh's army on their way to Nubia. We're getting closer to the first cataract. Here we can find many boulders with inscriptions, ancient hymns to the gods as well as hints and warnings for sailors, as the waters of this part of the Nile were considered particularly dangerous. We are on Sahel Island. It's like a diary of pharaonic Egypt. Hundreds of inscriptions, cartouches and reliefs commemorating officials and pharaohs were carved on granite boulders from the archaic times up until the Roman period. Annual flood observation and forecasting point was created here already during the Old Kingdom period. At that time Swened, Aswan, was only a small village while the city was Abu, located on the island of Philae. Images and inscriptions were created by scratching only the weathering rind, not using sophisticated tools, which makes them look more like graffiti. It's one of the most surprising and peculiar ancient sites that I've ever seen. We're in the holy land of Anuket, mistress of the island of Sahel, already in the old kingdom worshipped as the cataract goddess. She, who embrace, was in charge of the Nile waters of inundation, protecting Egyptians from floods. Goddess of abundance and fertility, revered as one of the elephantine triad, daughter of Knum and Setet, she was portrayed as a woman with a tall headdress, made either of reeds or ostrich feathers. She was also titled as a great huntress. Her animal symbol was a gazelle. Anukat was an omnipresent deity in Lower Nubia, mistress of Nubia. We saw the scene of Anukat breastfeeding Ramesses II in my episode about Nukalapsha. You can find the link below. In the New Kingdom, in the first month of the season of Shemu, harvest or low water, a river processional festival of Knum and Anuket took place. It was in the summer, the dry season that lasted from May to September, which was also the third and last one of the Egyptian calendar. When the annual flooding began, it was time for the great festival of Anuket. In gratitude to the goddess for her fertility, the faithful made offerings of jewelry, valuable items and even gold, which they threw into the Nile. Also, at that time, particular species of fish were eaten, 
which were considered sacred property of Anokat. They could only be eaten on this particular day. The Egyptians from the north considered Anokat the goddess of the sources of the Nile. For them, the first cataract was identified with the divine springs of the river. Although Sobek Hotep III and Amenhotep II erected small shrines for Anokat, for some reason Egyptians preferred to keep this sacred place rough and pristine, lacking spectacular structures. Texts carved in 550 granite boulders at Sehel give us priceless information about the history of the empire, including a testimony of a construction of a canal through the first cataract, making its waters navigable. It dates back to the Middle Kingdom, the 8th regnal year of Senusred III, pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. The testimony was written by Senanak, treasurer of the king, the royal sealer and leader of works in the whole land. The canal was named Beautiful are the ways of Kakaure. Kakaure is the throne name of Senusred III, the warrior pharaoh, the legendary Sesostris in Herodotus, according to whom the pharaoh was to invade Asia Minor and even Europe. The canal was one of the initiatives of this great and practical ruler, who was also to initiate the construction of the Canal of the Pharaohs, the so-called ancient Suez Canal, which was to connect the waters of the Nile Delta with the Red Sea. Sanank notes, we have reached the ends of Vavat, Lower Nubia, we have passed Senmut, Sehel. According to the author, the southern border of Kemet, Egyptian homeland, was on the island of Sehel. The canal construction was a part of the policy of the great pharaoh who carried out the consistent expansion of Nubia. The border was moved south along the Nile, where he built huge forts on the Nubian shores, among them enormous 13,000 square meters Buchen fortress on the second cataract, today northern Sudan. This wonderfully preserved fortification unfortunately lies today on the bottom of the Nasser Lake. Here we see a relief depicting Senusred III in front of the goddess Anukat, and next to them Neferhotep I, ruler of the 13th dynasty. Another text on Sehel from the time of Dutmos III mentions restoration of Senusred's canal hundreds years later. Regnalia 50, month 1, summer, day 22. Under the person of the dual king Menkaperra given life, decree of his person to cut this channel after he found it blocked with stones so that no ship could sail on it. He sailed north on it, his heart elated, after he had slain his enemies. The name of this canal is Opener of the Way as the Fair One of Menkaperra Living Eternally.
it is the fishermen of Abu who are to clear this canal every year. We're about to see the famous Ptolemic famine stele that tells about the events that were 2300 years old at the time of Ptolemies, times older for authors than the times of authors for us. To get there we have to climb up this steep mount with sliding stones and slippery sand. Of course I'm not properly dressed. The stele was most likely created during the reign of Ptolemy V. It already had this natural crack when the text was engraved on it. Its upper part shows the elephant in triad, in front of them Joseph, the pharaoh of the third dynasty making offerings. The hieroglyphic text tells a story of a terrible drought. The Nile had not risen for seven years, the grain was no longer abundant, the seeds were dry, everything that could be eaten was sparse, everyone was disappointed in his income. People no longer had the strength to walk, children were in tears, young men were defeated. The old ones had a sad heart. They were seated on the ground, their legs folded, their hands against them. Even the courtesans were in need, and the temples were closed, the sanctuaries were dusty. In short, all that existed was in distress. Joseph sends Imhotep to Upper Egypt to solve the problem. Imhotep learns that only Knum, the god of the source of the Nile, can help him, so he is heading to Elephantine, where the sacred source of the Nile is located. He purifies himself and prays to Knum. In his dream, he sees ram headed god, who assures him that the Nile will flow again. In return, Joseph ordered the restoration of the cult of Knum along with his temple. Nevertheless, this story was most likely a propaganda of the Knum priests, explaining in this way the importance of the sanctuary on Lephantine and naturally their influence, which they little by little were losing on behalf of the cult of Isis on Philae. Priests of Knum most likely turned to the universal theme of the seven-year famine, included in the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as in the story of the prophet Joseph in the Bible. It's time to leave the island of Sahel. The local desert wolves will soon leave their hiding places. May these beautiful goats be safe tonight. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It's time to go back to another ancient site, Elephantine Island, where I'm currently staying and which I'm gonna show you another time. So, to stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by liking, commenting and sharing my content with your friends.
perhaps you'd like to check out my previous episodes from Egypt or maybe from Turkey or Greece, <laughs> I'll link the playlist below in the description. And see you on another ancient site.